I want to talk to you very simply today about going from Mara to Edom. I shared, I, I preached this word before, and uh, as I was seeking the Lord, somehow God brought me back to the sermon, and I don't know why, but I think he, uh, he wants to, He wants us to hear this, and also maybe, uh, I believe He wants to minister to us in our point of need. I want to look at Exodus chapter 15, okay, Exodus chapter 15 and verse 22 onwards. And it reads this way. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? Verse 25. So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. That he made a statue and an ordinance for them, and, uh, and there he tested them. Verse 26, and said, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of this disease on you which I have brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. Verse 27. Then they came to Elam, where there were twelve wells of water and seventy palm trees. So they camped there by the waters. Okay? Here they are in a journey. If you just go out there, there's a map next to it. Next slide, if you don't mind. Yes, yeah, see for you. If you can just look at it, and probably uh, uh, if you look at those arrows, uh, the yellow arrows is the journey that Israel made uh, out of the Red Sea, out of, of obviously from Egypt, out of Egypt, and, uh, and and God brought them through the Red Sea, part of the Red Sea, and now they come to the, uh, to, to to one of the first places called Mara. Mara is where you can see a yellow pin, and a little bit more further is uh, Elim. Okay, and uh, uh, the the distance from the Red Sea to uh, Mara was about 40, 40 kilometers, which is about three days journey, all right? And after three days of journey and walking 40 kilometers with thousands and thousands of people, and how many of you know in the desert it was, it would have been hot, okay? For those of you who went to Israel, you know, it, it, it's still winter down there. It was still hot, okay? And even it, 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 you, you're, you're just parched, so dry, and here they're so desperate, and they come to a place called... Uh, Mara. Very interestingly, the, the word is also used in another story uh, called in the book of Ruth. And for those of you familiar in the book of Ruth, there is a, a, a there's a family uh, called uh, in, the, in that uh, in the book, and it's uh, uh, the name of the parents were Naomi and Elimelech. And my Naomi and Elimelech, they, they, they were living in Bethlehem. And what happened during this time in Bethlehem was there was great famine. And obviously, if there's famine, you're not going to have employment, or, and it's going to, life is going to be tough. And uh, so Elimelech and Naomi decided, we need something, we need to go to a greener pasture. Things are not working out for us, so we need to go somewhere else. So what they did was they decided to go to a place called Moab. All right, and when they went to Moab, they went to Moab with their two sons. And the name of the two sons was Malon and Chilion. All right, and Chilean, and, uh, and and so they were seeking a job, and they moved, they migrated to Moab from Bethlehem, and uh, and uh, in, in the course of time, these two boys of theirs, uh, they married, they married uh, one, one of the girls' name was Ruth, and uh, the other girl was uh, Orpa, not. Oprah, but Orpha, okay? I'm trying to pronounce it rightly, okay? And uh, and they married, and, and now life was good, because now we have sought uh, uh, employment, we have sought uh, better life, and uh, now my kids are married, and uh, what's the next thing is grandkids, and, uh, and life is great. But unfortunately, there's a twist in their life. What happens now is, as you're living there, the kids are married, she's got daughter-in-laws and all that going on, life is great, and Naomi's house husband, Elimelech, he dies in a foreign land. And after he dies, her next son dies. And there's a stop there, and the, 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 the unfortunate circumstances continue in her life, and both her sons, why, uh, both her sons die. 
And it's a very unfortunate circumstances. And now uh, Naomi is distraught. She is like, a, you know, she's gone to a place. It's like, what is happening to my life? I lost my husband. I lost my, my sons. Uh, and, and she comes to her daughter-in-law's named Naomi, excuse me, Ruth and uh, Orpha, and tells her, young ladies, I've got no more sons where you guys can marry, as it was a culture of those days. She said, now, I want you guys to go back to your own uh, home and, you know, and go and marry somebody else so that you can live your life. And Orpha says, okay, mother-in-law, I will do that. But, uh, but Ruth tells her, yes, no, I'm not going to go back. I want to be with you. And of course, we know that's the rest of the story. Now, Ruth and Naomi, they come back to Bethlehem. They come back to their hometown. Now, when they're coming back to the hometown, the hometown, you know, the, the neighbors, the families, the loved ones look at them and they get so excited. Wow, Naomi is back at last. She's home. They're so excited about her coming back. Naomi is home. Naomi is home. And they're so happy. And because they don't know about Ruth, because Ruth is somebody, you know, you know, it was all the marriage took place in Moab. Now they're so excited about Naomi coming home. And Naomi looks at her and she tells him, please don't call me Naomi. Please don't call me Naomi. You don't know what has happened in my life. Call me Mara. Because Naomi means pleasant. Is there a Naomi in the house today? Is there a Naomi today? Somebody, I mean, in the house, your name, Naomi. <laughs> your name, Naomi, it simply means pleasant. She says, there's nothing pleasant about my life. My husband is dead. My, my sons are dead. There's nothing pleasant in my life. Call me Mara. Simply means bitter. See, it's so important in life, the decisions that we make in life. Never make a decision by what you see in the natural circumstances. Never put your job before God. Amen. Come on. Amen. Seek God first. Put God as a priority in things. And, and you know, it's always greener somewhere else. It's always greener on the other side. If you're working for one organization, for one company, it'll always look greener. Wow, I wish I would over there. So look at their benefits. Look at, look at what they've got. Look at all the perks they've got. It's so much better. But, and when, when you get there and you turn back and say, well, that was a better place where I was at. At least I was able to go home and have dinner with my family. At least I used to have weekends off here. I got the perks and all the things, but I got no free time. It always looks better. It always looks greener. And we say, well, Pastor, you don't understand. The grass is greener on the other side. My grass is all brown. Let me give you a clue. Let me give you a advice. Start watering the grass where you are at right now. Maybe the brown grass may start turning to green. Start watering it. You know, it can change. See, and, and that's what we see a number of, uh, a couple of, uh, how decisions, how the decisions that we make affects us. Abraham was one of the, when God gave an amazing test of uh, uh, promise to him. He says, Abraham, you're going to have descendants. Look at the stars. Can you number the stars? He said, God, I can number the stars. Yes, that's how your descendants are going to be. Look at the sand. Can you number the sand? No, that's how your descendants are going to be. And here's this great, mighty man of God. He gets up. Oh, God is going to give me descendants. And there was a circumstance, a situation that came upon him. And he ran to Egypt with his wife. And, and he was afraid of the king and told the king, uh, told his wife, now, when they ask you, don't say that you're my wife. Because you're very beautiful, Sarah, and they're going to take you. Say you're my sister. Here, the father of our faith, telling his wife to lie and not acting out of faith. <laughs> All right? Decisions. Did God ask him to run because there was a famine, there was a problem in the land to run to Egypt? No. And the other stories about a story about his own nephew Lot. They had, they were not able to get to get along with each other. And Lot comes to his uncle Abraham, said, "Uncle, we need to have a talk." What's it, nephew? Well, your man and our my man, they can't get along. I we, we need to split our ways. We need to go separate ways. This is just not going to work for you. This is not going to work for me. But uh, Uncle Abraham said, "Lot, just hang on for a while, Lot. We will work things out." He said, "No, no, no, uncle. This is not going to work." 
words, I am going my ways. Let's part ways. Of course, Uncle Abraham was very mature. And he said, well, you choose the part which you want to go. So Lot looks at all the land. And what does he pick? He picks a nice, green, flourishing place. And he chose to go to the green and green, greener pastures. And when he ends up, where does he end up? In Sodom. And what you call it Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Yeah. What happens is decisions. His decisions affected him. <coughs> End of the day, his wife turned into a pillar of salt. His whole family was messed up. He lost his family because of his one selfish decision, one selfish reason. That he couldn't get along and go on with his uncle. If he wanted to do that, he would have preserved and protected his family. How many of you know, it would, you know, decisions that we make affects our lives. It not only affects our life, it affects our family. You don't want to make a decision where you go to a new place and your wife turns into a pillar of salt. <laughs> or your husband. Okay, what happened? Well, my wife turned into a pillar of salt. What was that? What was that? What happens? They got there and the city got into them. And the Bible, because they got out of it and, 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 and one decision they made. And that's what I want to minister to you today, this afternoon about. As uh, Naomi and, 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 and Ellen Malik, they made a decision to get out of from where they were. I'm not sure. Maybe, you know, it doesn't give us enough information, but maybe they thought in the natural mind, this is the best thing to do. Please, just don't make decisions just based on your intellect. I hope somebody's hearing me that today. Amen. Seek the Lord. Amen. Can I even take it further? I beg you. I beg you. I plead with you this afternoon. Seek God for your decisions that you make. Because it will affect you. It will affect your family. It will affect your kids. It will affect the generation that is yet to come. You don't want to walk, go back home one day and say, I am a, an orphan. I am a, a widow. I know I've lost my family because of one decision. Any decision, whether it's a job opportunity, whether anything that you do, seek God first. Somebody please say amen. 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 Hallelujah. Please seek the Lord. Please seek the Lord. Yes, I'm not saying we shouldn't be ambitious. It's good to be ambitious. Yes, it's good to, yeah, it's okay to seek for employment or better jobs, a better salary. It's all good, but let it be guided by the spirit of the Lord. What is your drive? What is your reason of doing it? That's so important. And here, God's people, they come and they journey to, and they come to this place called Mara and they position themselves and they base themselves in this place called Mara. Mara simply means bitterness. And after crossing the Red Sea, Mara was the first place of encampment. Mara is not a vacation spot where you want to bring your family to. It's not a place where you want to say, come on, this, this summer holidays, I'm bringing my family to Mara. You don't want to do that. Okay? A number of years ago, I remember, uh, you, know, uh, uh, my, you know, my family wanted to go to Thailand, so we ended up in Bangkok, and then we heard of this place. And I just made this decision, I want to be a good husband, be a good father, for, you know, make those, uh, help my family have a good holiday. I tell you what, we end up in nowhere. It was like from, we, we arrived in Bangkok, what about one o'clock, was it about one o'clock in the afternoon, and we ended up in a place like eight o'clock at night. Even the driver does not know where the hotel was. <laughs> and let me tell you, we go down there, we are the only place where, it's not even a hotel, it's like, I mean, how many of you have seen stuff on the website? You know, they always have these nice, beautiful rooms. <laughs> it's always, either when they, they took those photos, either when they first built it, <laughs> or after a renovation, or maybe from some other hotel. <laughs> okay, your bed looks good. <laughs> this is the suite you're having. I mean, I'm not talking about a presidential suite. I'm talking about a bungalow house for, I mean, you know, you know it's like for a night, maybe, maybe at the top, 800 Hong Kong dollars. Maybe it was even less than that. It was great price. I mean, but we ended up like nowhere. And you know, and, and, and it doesn't take much for my wife to, you know, in terms of hygiene, if we go down there, you have ants crawling all over the place, you know. And next day we go down there, the guy gives us a breakfast coupon. Come in tomorrow morning, so somehow we get through the night, okay? And we go to the breakfast and we give this coupon to us and we're asking, so we think expect a lot of people to be there for breakfast, guys giving coupon, he's got bell and all that, you know, going on. So he says, where's the breakfast place? 
He says, right there, nobody's there. Only the flies are there. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. There's a lot of flies. There's a lot of flies. But it was, I mean, I just wanted to dig a ditch and, and say, and just conduct a funeral. And uh, I'll be happy. I just don't know where. You know, that, I couldn't redeem myself. You know, even if I had money, we, you know, we paid for it already. And that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, a couple of nights we stayed or something. You know, but the best thing about it was, there was they had a beach that nobody else was at the beach. Okay. <laughs> Kids were a bit younger at the time. So we said, okay, let, let's bring them to the swimming pool. We go to the swimming pool. It is surrounded by black ants. We talk about this big. <laughs> this big. I mean, I was thinking, oh God, okay, okay, let the kids go to the playground. They go to the playground. The slides, the rims, it's rusty and dirty and I'm like, this is like from hell, you know. So, you don't want to bring your family there. You don't want to do that. Don't even ask me the address. So every year, subsequent year after that, I always ask my wife, have I redeemed myself yet? You know, has my time of redemption come yet? You know, it's a horrible time. You know, it was, uh, it was, you know, so I you know, just like going to Mara. I think I don't know Mara. Thinking about that, Mara would have been a better place for me at the time. I don't know. But Mara's not a place you want to go. It's a bitter place. It's a bitter place. And a uh, little bit further than Mara was a place called Eden. Elim simply means palms. It is a vacation spot. The Bible tells us that, uh, that uh, in Elim that, that there were uh, uh, you know, palms and there were sweet water and there were 70 palm trees. The interesting thing about Mara in Elim is that, is their distance. If you don't mind, uh, just go back to the map if you don't mind. Right, you know, just a couple of slides back. In a, in the interesting thing about them is that they, the distance between Mara and Elim you know, uh, the, the different ones have few, uh, you know, the, the difference is it's very little, but they were quite close. The distance is actually about seven miles from each other, from Mara to Eden. It's only about seven uh, miles, which is about like 11 kilometers. Okay, let's do the Hong Kong style. You jump, if you can see, it's just a straight line, right? Straight arrow across going to Mara. If we jump on a taxi in Hong Kong, this is what you say, Ungoi, Chakoi, that's all. Go straight. Check hoi. He said, what? We, we try to go, no, go check hoi. That's all I know. Even if you go check hoi, you will meet even. That's, that's how simple it was. Okay? Okay. He said, here they No, no, no. Check hoi. Just keep going, going. Go straight. You will reach even. In our day and time, probably you will reach a place. If you don't get a ticket from the police, you can do it in 10, 12 minutes. But if you, if you step on the, on the gas, you probably can do even less than that. But in that day, it was only a half a, a day's journey to that location. And it was very, very close in proximity. It's not, it didn't take too long. It's not like walking from the Red Sea all the way to Mara, which is like 40 kilometers. This is only about, about 11 kilometers, 7 miles from each other. The first thing I want to leave with you today is this, that Elim was only 7 miles down the road. See, too many times, too many times people give up in Mara because of the disappointments, because of the challenges, because of the hurt, because of the pain. You don't understand where I am. You don't understand what I'm going through. And, and, uh, and, and people give up too much, too fast in Mara. I'm hurt too bad. I'm hurt too. The things that happen to my life is way too much. I just need to, I, and I'm just going to give up. Because... You gotta understand, Elam was just seven miles down the road. So fast, so quick, they give up. But you might ask a question today. Well, Pastor, how did they know that Elam was seven miles down the road? They didn't know. They didn't have a GPS like the way we did. <laughs> we do. We have a GPS. They had a GPS those days. Did you know that? Yes. They had a GPS, God's positioning system. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Where have God positioned them? Wherever God positioned them, you stay. You move. And how did, how did God's positioning system work? God's GPS work? By cloud by day and a, uh, 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 excuse me, and a pillar of fire by night. 
Cloud move, you move. Cloud stop, you stop. God's positioning system. That's how. At night time, the pillar move, you move. Pillar stop, you stop. God's positioning system. So that was GPS during those days. Okay? And it was God's way of positioning them, God's way of directing them, God's way of uh, positioning His people. So they were guiding them. And, 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 and the thing is this. Did the cloud, all the uh, pillar of fire, stop in Mara? Did it stop? But who might say today how bad your pain is? How bad your hurt is, your condition might be. See, people give up too fast. Not being able to trust the Lord that God will bring them. God will never bring you to Mara to stay in Mara. God will always bring you through Mara to go to Eden. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. God will never bring you to Mara to stay, but to bring you through to go to Elam. I want to ask you a question, ladies and gentlemen, today. Is the water that you're tasting in life today, is it bitter? Is the bitter waters of Mara that you're tasting? Is your life full of bitterness and heartaches? Then you'll say, I'm ready to turn back and go back to Mara. I, I'm going to take even a step more backward. That is, I'm willing to go back to Egypt. Are you in a place today where you want to make such decisions? God led his people by the cloud and by the fire by night. Today, God leads his people by his Holy Spirit. He leads us by faith. How many of you know the scripture tells us to all those who are led by the Spirit of God, our sons of God? Amen. We are God's children. And He leads us, He guides us. Don't stay in Mara. Go through Mara and get to Eden. In life, we can never escape Mara, but we are never meant to stay in Mara. Do you hear me that? Amen. We cannot escape Mara. But we have to go through Mara. But we are never meant to stay in Mara. We are meant to move from Mara to in. Hallelujah. Second thought I want to leave with you is this. You can go from Mara to Eden anytime. You might be saying, well, I'm living in this pain. I'm living in this bitterness. I'm living in this condition. You just don't understand what you mean, Pastor. You just don't know the hurt that I have. Let me tell you something about hurt. The hurt that you got... It's a big deal. The hurt and the pain that you receive in life, that you encounter in life, that you, you experience in life, it is real. And I'm not minimizing your pain. I'm not no way minimizing it's no big deal. It is a deal, but how big you want to make it, it's up to you. If you want to make it a big deal, it is up to you. See, we will go through when somebody offends you. Let me tell you, it is hurting. Oh, please help me by saying amen if you believe that. <laughs> you guys are like, Pastor, I'm steel. It's like an oz, you know. I'm like a, the Iron Man. You know, even Iron Man, he feels. <laughs> you know, I'm you know, like oz. You know, I don't have a heart. I don't feel anything. Let me tell you, when somebody offends you, it hurts you. It is painful. When somebody, if you're in a broken relationship, it hurts you. It is painful. But how big you want to make it, it's up to you. You have a choice whether you want to be in this place and go through this place and come to a place called Elam. You can go from Mara to Elam anytime. Question, what is the way to Elam? Elam is as close as someone else who is hurting. Someone else who is in need. Someone else who needs help. Someone else who is in misery. Someone else who is unfortunate. The way to Eden is by you reaching out to somebody else. That's the way to Eden. When you reach out to somebody else, you find out that not only you've gone through a difficult time, but somebody else goes through a difficult time. And maybe he just might find out that somebody else might have gone through an even more challenging time than you have. Maybe you lost a husband, but somebody else might have lost a whole family. And how they deal with it. And it will help you. If you're going through a difficult time, one of the best things to do is to reach out to somebody else. 
reach out to somebody else. Help somebody else. Every time you feel like a, and, 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 and what would help you is that would bring you from Mara to Eden. The scripture tells us in Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 25, the generous soul will be made rich and he who waters will also be watered himself. What it simply means is if you reach out to somebody else, you yourself will be blessed. Amen. If you bless somebody else in your point of need, even in your limitations, you yourself will be watered yourself. Amen. If you refresh somebody else, you yourself will be refreshed. Amen. Hallelujah. Eddie, is not I know we were all so tired when we I mean it was a full week for everybody. I mean we just got back from Israel and so much going on and and you know we couldn't try to we come back, we are refreshed. Amen. Just to see in the midst of the tiredness as you're reaching other people. And, and God has a way of turning it back around. In the book of Ecclesiastes, it tells us, cast your bread upon the water and one day you'll come back. It's a principle that has to work because it's the word of God. In your pain, reach out to somebody else. Too many times Christians, I like to call it, they are navel grazers. We're just so locked into our own little world. Aren't we? We get so locked into our own world. Look, go into training these days. Whoever looks at anybody, Hey, you know, whoever looks at, you know, I was telling people, I, I've heard more people complain about neck problems these days than anything else. You know, today, this morning, I was in Discovery Bay. I told Pastor Robert for once, it's great for my head to be lifted up because the, uh, the screen was really high up there. And I was looking up. Otherwise, most of the time, we are like this, aren't we? In our little devices, our phones. You know, we get so cooped up in our little world. It's my problem, it's my pain, it's my this, it's my that. And let me tell you, selfishness stinks. Yes. yes. Come on. Yeah. When people are selfish, eventually you don't want to hang out with them. Because there's something that stinks about their attitude. Come on, let me, let me just talk to you like the way the Word of God tells us. Selfish. Somebody just brought me lunch. Yeah, because not for you, it's for me. But you're not eating, that's right. But because I'm eating up by stinginess. By the cringe is eating me up. You want to get out of it? Get out of Mara? Reach out to somebody else. You want to start complaining? Stop complaining. Start complimenting somebody. Amen. Hallelujah. That's why I love, you know, I want to I want to encourage as I'm in the point. You know, these days everybody's got it. I was just looking at all the devices I have in my house. I couldn't believe it. Steve Jobs had a vision 30 years ago. I told you what? He said one day there'll be a computer in every home. I think it's all, I think he was he's a computer. He's a computer, it's computers! We have one device for right hand, one device for the left hand, one device for our eyes. We're like, like I mean, you start my or something, you know, so, hey, you know, and this is what, we're just playing games. Nobody plays games in this church, I know. All you guys do, use your phones, it's running for Bible. I know you want to use it to talk to your loved ones and your family members and encourage people. And nobody plays any games here, you know, and, uh, we get so caught up. And while I'm talking about that, let me just take a little more further. Be mindful of what you put in your social network. Come on. Don't say praise God for this wonderful morning and cuss your, your boss in the afternoon and say amen at night. <laughs> and, and, and on top of all that, you say you're a Christian and you're inviting somebody, from the, somebody to church. Let me tell you, nobody's going to come to church if you're going to start doing that. Yes. If you want to be a Christian, be a Christian even in your social network. Amen. Come on. Amen. Don't, don't, don't backbite your boss. Don't say bad about your colleagues. Oh, it's on lunch break. I'm blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and then you expect us in the church community to come and feel, oh, feel so bad for you. No, I don't feel bad for you. You're not being a Christian. Come on. You're just not sitting on the peanut gallery and gossiping. You are gossiping through your social network. Yes. I don't feel pretty for you. Sorry. That's not Christian like. And after that night time, we say, Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for this day. Oh, I'm inviting somebody to church this Sunday. Oh, your friend is not going to come to church. Believe me. Because that's not the kind of Christian they want to be. Christian on Monday, something else on a... Uh, sorry, Christian on a Sunday, something else on a Monday. No. Can we be consistent? Otherwise, don't say you're a Christian in the social networks. 
Yeah, just do, don't, just don't do that. Sometimes that's why we get so caught up in our little selfish world. We want to be the, what the flesh wants and we stay in Mara and we never have breakthroughs in our life. We never have the, the touch of God in, and we never break through and move to a place that is Eden, which is a place of God's blessings and promises and a place that God wants us to live. You need to know today that you can't get from Mara to Eden on your knees. Pastor, what, 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 what are you talking about? This is what I'm talking about. Now, this is Mara. I'm on my knees. Okay, the rest of the verses. How do I get from Mara to Elam? Uh, don't get too spiritual. Let's do practical stuff. <laughs> How do I get from Mara to Elam? Basic. Help me out. Okay, I walk. I walk, and I'm here at Elam. Now, what happens is we are so bound in life, so many stuff happens in life, so we are on our knees. God, get me out of Mara. Get me to Eden. Oh, hallelujah. Shut to the <laughs> So I go to church on Sunday. Pastor Sully, please pray for me. Pastor Sully prays for you, casts out a bunch of demons out of me. <laughs> hallelujah, I'm set free. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, where am I? <laughs> where am I? Okay. I'm in. Yeah, a bunch of people pray for me. And I go back. I go to Iconegro. I go to Tuesday prayer meeting. Oh, please pray for me. I need to get to Mar. I need to get to Eden. And uh, after I pray, they pray for me like for 45 minutes and cast out another bunch of demons out of me. And I feel so good about it. Now, where am I? So you can't get to Elam on your knees. On your knees, you can make a decision to get to Elam. And what you do after that, you do one of the most spiritual things that you can, and that is to get up and put some feet to your prayer. And you can get there. Amen. And many times people just pray and pray and pray. Prayer is good. Please don't limit prayer. But the prayer in itself, you want to be effective, you've got to put feet to your prayer. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. If we feed to prayer, then we will see something happen. Amen. Hallelujah. It is practical. God is spiritual, but still, He works, us, works through some practical stuff in our lives. Third thought I want to leave with you is this Mara is as close to Elam as Elam is to Mara. Elam was seven miles away. From bitterness. Elim was seven miles away from depression. Elim was seven miles away from critical spirit. Elim was seven miles away from self pity and anger. Elim was self, seven miles away from discouragement. But what happens is this. On our way to Elim, or even when we've arrived at Elim, once circumstances, a situation can take place, and we end up in. Mara. Because Mara is as close to Elim as Elim is to Mara. I know you didn't get what, what I was trying to say. Amen. This is what it means, simply. Let me put this way. So we are in this place. I told you you were praying and on your knees and doing all that and you got up. And you know you didn't get there. Now, let me put this way. I need to forgive somebody. Okay? So I've forgiven that person. I got up on my knees. I forgive them. I said, praise God, because the church prayed for me. I went for a prayer meeting. I went for Ike and group, and people prayed, and a bunch of demons got out of me and all that. Praise be to God. On a Sunday at this, whatever the time is right now, I am at Eden. Praise be to Jesus. But what happens is this. On a Monday morning, I heard fantastic. <laughs> you say, Pastor John, what a wonderful service it was. Oh, praise God. And now you're on the empty hour, and then you're on the bus. You're sitting down, and then you are uh, going, okay, this is the stuff I need to do at work today. Suddenly, you have a, a thought comes in. The thought comes in about the person you just forgave yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> and what happens is, and you keep thinking about the person. Uh-huh. Why did I forgive the person? <laughs> the person didn't deserve my forgiveness. You know, 
how bad they did. Maybe I should undo my forgiveness. Do you know what actually they did? You know how it hurt me? You know how it affected me? You know how they are? By the time you reach your office, you are where? I do. The problem is this. Can I just, can I look at two young men right here. Andrew, can you come and uh, Jeremy, would you please come for a moment? Just come on, real quick. Hey, put that in coffee, man. That's okay, otherwise you're gonna spill it on me. <laughs> Mara, and, and, and there's a constant struggle. Please, since you came first, you take the Eden. Okay, and you, if you can stay, uh, stay in Mara, just stay there for a little while, please. And this is what happens for us. The struggle is, it's not forgiveness. How many of you know it's easy to forgive? Yes. You're looking at me, that is hard. Man, we gotta start a whole series of forgiveness here. It's easy to forgive sometimes. Yes. But to stay in a place of forgiveness is hard. Yes. And I believe this is how our mind works. Hold my hand, man. This is a strong guy, gotta be careful. You hold my hand. Okay. This is Elim. This is Mara. And this is how our mind works. I want both of you to pull me. Yeah, yeah, I'm serious. I'm, I'm yeah, tough guy. Yeah. I'm tough guy. Okay, one hand, one hand, one hand. Yeah. I know that's stupid. One hand, one hand. Okay, pull me. Pull me. And that's what happens. And eat him. Yes, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. I'm going to eat him. And try to eat him. Says, hey, come on. Come on. Strong, man. I'm going to eat him. I'm going to eat him. That's why he's going to eat him. I'm going to eat him. Take my hands off my head. <laughs> so that's what happens. Okay, now you guys relax. This is what happens. We go back and forth, don't we? Yes. yes. I know, no, no. This is what he did to me. This is what he did to me. And this is how mine works. But lunchtime, no, 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 I need to forgive. Oh, the pastor preached yesterday. No, 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 no. We got to do this job. You know what I'm saying? Yes. yes. And this is the, the talk. We're tossing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And this is a problem we have. Amen. Give this guy a great big hand. Thank you. <laughs> Still got it. Okay. And that's a challenge. That's a struggle that we have. Let me make the statement. The best Christian in this church, the best Christian in the world, the most spiritual and the happiest Christian is only seven miles or 11 kilometers away from Mara. Just as quick as you got to eat it, you can get back to Mara. Help me out. Is that right? Yeah. It's great that you forgive that person. My concern is not just forgiving them today. It's about tomorrow. Stay in the place. <clears throat> what they did to me. They cannot do that to me. They kind of think, how they offended me. You know who I am? You know what I've done? You know how they made fun of me? And you know what you're doing? You're stripping back into Mara. And, on, and then you come for a you know, church service or a you know, nice believers meeting or I connect and you get so all hyped up and then excited and you go back again to eat it. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm free. Come on, brother. Forgive somebody. Come on. Reach out to somebody and forgive. Come on. Tell somebody you love them. And after a while, you're going back home. You think about the person and going back again. <laughs> it's a ping pong that's going on. Because Elim and Mara are very close. Yes. It is just one thought away. One retaliation. And you say, Pastor John, you've been talking about everybody, how about you? <laughs> Thank you for asking me the question. Unfortunately, I do stay in Mara. I do. But I'll try my best to keep my visit to Mara as short as possible. And I pray that you do too. If you limit your time in Mara and head over to a place, called Eden. We can always have so many, but this, but that, but they did this to me. We have this really good religion syndrome. No money, there's a buddy, yeah, you know. <laughs> but this, but that. Oh, look, let me see how many more excuses you need or you need to give before you get to Eden. How many more do you need? The reason I felt, you know, I was seeking the Lord this week. Say, God, with all these events that's going on in the world, maybe I need to talk about the end time, maybe about the coming of the Lord. But I really felt so strongly God lead me to this sermon today. You know why? Because I just felt God just tell me there are people who get upset with me, John. 
You know that people get upset with God? And, I'm, and that made me feel so much better. It's just not people get upset with me. God, they get upset with you too. So that's okay, God. You know, that's good. At least you know you, 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 know, you, you, you handle all that stuff. Because if people get upset with God. The people get upset with me. They need to know. They don't, when, when you get upset with God, you stay in Mara. You get upset with your husband. You get upset with your wife. You get upset with your children, with your colleagues, with people around. You stay and you, you become a citizen of Mara. God didn't bring you to stay in Mara. God brought you to go through Mara. Nobody can escape Mara in life, but we are never meant to stay in Mara. Amen. Come on, give God a shout out for you. About the 1800s, there was a man named Evan Roberts. God used to bring, bring great revival in Wales. And that revival swept through UK. That revival swept through America, all through Asia. And it came to a point that even in Wales, the two years soccer matches were canceled because of the great move of God. And in New York, where, uh, where people, businesses would come and have a couple of hours of lunch breaks, not to have longer lunch for eating, but they would all come and seek the Lord. It was such an amazing move of God. When God used Evan Roberts, he was only probably in his early 20s, and he was a coal miner. God used him so mightily. But what happened to him was, he was in Eden. God used him so mightily through him. I mean, this revival phenomenon began to flow through all over the world. But what happened is he realized, Evan Roberts, he got a bit jealous. Because God was raising more people up. And he was not the only one that God was using. And what happened to him? He got jealous of other people. He got a little more jealous. He got angry at God. He got angry with God. And he ended up, well, the history tells us, there could be a possibility that he died as a bitter man. Whom God used so mildly. It doesn't matter who it is. Because Elim is as close to Mara as Mara is close to Elim. It can happen to anybody. It can happen to anybody. See it's Spurgeon. Many of you know that name. You know the books, I and mean, even the books are available. C.H. Spurgeon, he, he passed to one of the most amazing churches in London, England, Metropolitan Church. At the age of 18, he passed to this amazing church. And he wrote, preached some amazing sermons. We had, we had one of his great grandsons in our service many years ago. Amazing, amazing man he was. God used him so mightily. History also tells us, towards the last stage of his life, he was, uh, uh, he, he was, his body was af uh, affected by, uh, 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 I think it was arthritis. Let me, let me just check real quickly. It was uh, arthritis that entered his body. He was very bitter towards God. And he held the bitterness even towards the point of death. Here these are people who are mightily, mightily used by God. So close to God. They were in Eden, but they ended up in Mara. Church, where do you want to be? Eden or Mara? If you want to go to Eden, if you're in Mara today, you want to go to Eden, you got to let go. And let God. Breathe. I want to share this one last story in closing. I want to talk Brother Alan, would you please come? Many years ago, when my eldest daughter, when she was about three or four years old, she was downstairs, she was playing. And after a while, I heard this loud scream. She was just screaming her guts out, you know. And I uh, quickly went down and uh, looked to see what was happening. And she was playing well, I think it was the bicycle or something she was playing with. And when I got to her, she was so heavily, you know, bruised and, you know, her knees was just bleeding. You know, it was just bleeding. It was so bad. And what I did was I got a hold of her, I carried her, and I brought her to the house. And what... What Abigail was doing was she she held her uh, held her uh, a leg towards her body, and I held her, holding her, comforting her, she, you know, uh, taking looking after her, and uh, watch and, and 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 making sure that she was feeling alright. But let me tell you, it was a very it was bloody, it was just bad, you know, for that age. And she was just about three years or four, I'm not sure, is around that age, and she was just crying her guts out. And I was saying, hey, daddy's here. I'm just uh, holding you. And she was feeling the comfort of her father. But at the same time, she was experiencing the pain of her life. While I was holding her, she was holding her pain. 
Well, I was comforting and hugging her, and she knew at the moment she's one of the most safest places in the planet, and that is in the arms of her father. And I would tell her, Abigail, now I want you to let go of the leg because daddy wants to treat your wound. Daddy wants to put medicine on you. Daddy wants to make you feel well. But she wouldn't let go of her leg. But keep in mind, she knew she was the most safest place on the planet. No better place you could have been in but the hands of her own dad who loves her. And I was not meaning any evil. I was not like, come on, let go of your leg. Let me put some salt on that wound. Let me see you cry. No, that was not even a thought in my mind. All I wanted was to minister healing to her. I wanted to help her. And I got the medicine. I said, come on, girl. Let go of that wound. She was holding on to her leg. And I'm holding her. Keep in mind, she was in the most safest place in the planet. At the same time, she was in the most worst possible time. Isn't that interesting? You can be in the most safest place in life, but be at the same time at the worst possible situation in your life. Think about that. Think about that. This girl, she was at that age, that was the biggest pain in her life. She wouldn't let go. I had to keep, come on, girl, come on. Look, like daddy loves you. Daddy wants to help you. Daddy wants to put medication on you. Daddy wants to help you. She just wouldn't let go. And this makes me think how many times that we are in the arms of our loving Savior. But we're not ready to let go. Today, you and I are in the arms of a loving Savior, people of God. And we are in Mara, and our Heavenly Father is saying, Would you let go? And I want to bring you to Eden. I want to bring my daughter to Eden to heal her, to put medication on her. Is that, is that the irony of life? Sometimes we know we're the most safest place on earth. But same time, have the greatest pain that we ever experienced in life. But do we have to live that way? Eventually, after much persuasion, after much talk, much consoling, she would release her hand. Now she let go. And now daddy can. Today, if you let go, God can. God can. How long are we going to be in Mara? How long are we going to stay there? Can you let go of your pain? Can you let go of the person who hurt you? Can you let go of the man who offended you, who abused you? Can you let go of somebody who did you wrong? Can you let go of the disappointments and let God carry you in the most safest place on the planet? He can bring you and give you rest and minister to your needs. Will you allow God? Would you allow God to do that today? I would like you to stand up with me today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to read one last scripture. 1 Samuel 16 and verse 1. And it reads this way. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. Saul was, Samuel was very crucial in uh, the, the king that was chosen. But Saul, he disappointed God. And Samuel was mourning for him. And God told Samuel, Samuel, the days you have cried, you have mourned for it, the day is over. Now you get up and you get to eat. What God was saying is, the time of mourning is over. This is the day that the Lord has made. Samuel, it's time to rejoice because I'm going to anoint a brand new king and it's a brand new day for Israel. Hallelujah. And that's what God was saying. Israel is not going to be in a place of mourning and whining and complaining. In time, those days are over. Now you get up and go and anoint a brand new king. And I believe the same thing. God is speaking to each and every one of us today. Men and women of God, ladies and gentlemen, your days of mourning, your days of crying, your days of complaining, your days of being disappointed courage. I believe God is saying, it's over. It's finished. Get up. It's a brand new day. And walk to Eden where I've got blessings for you. Hallelujah. Where I want to prosper you. I have great future. Great things in store. Don't be pulled back by the circumstances of your life. Move to Eden. 
Hallelujah. Rise up. That's what he tells us. Get up. How long will you mourn so? God is asking, how long are you going to complain? How long are you going to be complaining about your circumstances? How long are you going to be critical? How long are you going to be cynical? How long are you going to be depressed? Has it been long enough? Say this with me. This is the day. This is the day. The Lord has made. It. Lord has made it. It's a brand new day. It's a brand new day for me. In Jesus' name, give the Lord a mighty.